Why did gold fail as a currency? As we look at the history, we find it surprisingly never had much success. While gold and silver have had value throughout history, gold was often not the dominant form of money, and silver dominated far longer. The earliest gold memories gives us insight into why gold is so popular. It also allows us to see how history has consistently repeated itself over time. The earliest gold memories are in ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians loved gold because it reminded them of their sun god Ra who was referred to as the Mountain of Gold. In ancient Egypt, gold represented the flesh of the gods and was used for anything eternal or indestructible. But despite their love of gold, barley was used as their money. The first recorded use of gold as money was 2400 years later in 643 BCE, or before the Common Era, in Lydia. Lydia had rich gold and silver deposits, and they were the first to discover how to separate the two valuable minerals. Lydia is located in present-day Turkey, which is next to present-day Iran. Despite its wealth, the Lydians were captured by the Persian leader Cyrus the Great around 550 BCE. Cyrus the Great may not be too well known to modern-day North Americans, but he is still a hero to this day in Iran. He was known to be a brilliant military strategist who is also merciful. He freed the Jews from the Babylonians and allowed them to return from exile to Jerusalem in 539 BCE and they were able to begin the reconstruction of the second temple. The Persians melted down the gold and remade new coins, but the Persian gold reserves would soon transfer to the Greeks. Alexander the Great invaded and took over the Persian gold and melted down the coins to display his face. However, over time there was debasement, which was a problem which would soon occur in the emerging Roman Empire. It also shows a key flaw in paying for things with inherent value such as paying for a good with gold or silver. The rule was codified by Gresham in the 1500s. He said bad money drives out good. We will explain this in a second, but first let's explain debasement. Debasement can be seen in the following example. Essentially, a coin can buy a certain number of apples, say 50, but over time, the coin has less and less gold or silver in it, but it can either buy the same amount of apples or more apples, However, over time people realize there is less gold or silver in the coin and there is inflation, which means you need more coins to buy the same 50 apples. Say you need now 10 coins instead of the original one. The Romans used mostly silver as their currency and not gold. Its citizens accepted some debasement and the coin could buy 1.6 to 2.8 times its metal content, meaning the coin was worth more than the silver in the coin. However, as the Roman Empire weakened, the quality of the metals and debasement grew. Over time, the amount of gold or silver in the coin was reduced, but the Roman government demanded tax payments in pure gold and silver and issued coins at a debased price. You might call this unethical and corrupt, and only very early governments would steal from its citizens like this. At this time, gold was not used much as a currency, but commodity money was showing notable flaws. But how would gold work as a currency? As we move through the Middle Ages, and governments became more organized and trustworthy? We will answer this question, and this will help us figure out why gold failed as a currency. Hey guys, if you like this type of video, please hit the like button and subscribe. Also visit our Patreon page if you wanna show extra support. Thomas Gresham created the famous law in the 1500s, which says bad money drives out good. This means while a coin may start at 50 apples, Eventually, less valuable coins replace the valuable ones, which is the issue with commodity money. People would do everything such as clip coins to remove precious silver and gold content from the coin. As we move through the Middle Ages, gold continued to be used in a similar fashion to the way the ancient Romans, Greeks, Persians, and Lydians used it. Gold was rare, and silver continued to be the currency of choice. However, we saw early precursors of paper money in 7th century China. And in the 1100s, under the Yang Dynasty, China used fiat money, which means the money had value because the government said so. Fiat is the type of money that we use today. However, this was not very successful, and the people preferred transacting in silver. But this introduction was written about by Marco Polo, an Italian merchant and explorer who traveled to China in the 1300s. The first fiat currencies entered Europe in the 1500s in Spain, but commodity money was still dominant. Starting in the 1300s, gold would rise to prominence through the Florin gold coin, first made in Florence, Italy. The Florin became a benchmark for international trade, especially for large transactions. 
Gold also played an important role in Christopher Columbus's travels. King Ferdinand of Spain, who financed Columbus in the late 1400s said, get gold humanly if you can, but at all hazards, get gold. As we move back to England, in 1640, Charles I, the King of England, Ireland, and Scotland, indirectly accelerated the use of paper money and the private banking system by seizing everyone's gold. At the time, private citizens kept their gold at the Royal Mint. Charles seized their assets to pay off his debts, though he did first ask the citizens nicely for charity before seizing the gold. The people were not impressed. Charles I eventually repaid back the gold, but the damage was done. Citizens now would start keeping their gold at private goldsmiths. A goldsmith was someone who worked with gold and made jewelry, but they started to play a large role and they started storing people's gold. As the goldsmiths gathered more gold, they would often lend it out and they are precursors for the modern day banking system. Charles I wouldn't fare so well. The citizens protested and he was eventually beheaded in 1649. The crime was using the throne for his own interest rather than the good of the people. Seizing citizens' money put the wheels in motion for banking, as goldsmiths started lending paper notes. The goldsmiths would give out paper-backed money and give a promise that they would pay. The Bank of England was not happy, as many institutions had many different notes. The monarchy sought to win back power of the currency over the goldsmiths, but they wouldn't just yet. The government of England would take back control of the currency in 1708, when it restricted the goldsmiths' issue of notes. As we move through the 1700s, gold was becoming more prominent. Many historians attribute Sir Isaac Newton as having a fundamental role to play in the rise of the gold standard. Newton wrote his theory on gravity in the 1680s, and because he was a prominent figure, many historians want to say that not only did an apple fall on his head, but a gold bar did also. So how was he involved in currency? Newton had a midlife crisis at 51, or in 1693, and he took a ceremonial but high paying position as warden of the royal mint, which was responsible for making new coins. Soon he became the master of the mint, which paid about 1.2 million equivalent in today's US dollars, versus only about 60,000 of an academic. In his new role, Newton would lower the value of silver relative to gold, and the historians say this moved England onto the gold standard. Let's see what Newton did in an example. Previously, it would cost 20 coins to buy one gold coin, but Newton lowered it to make it 21, which means it would take more silver coins, or it would be more expensive to buy gold with silver than it was before. This change came into effect in 1717. Despite this change, the historians are not correct. Before Newton made this change, silver was already exiting Britain rapidly as people continued to buy gold. In fact, before Newton made this change, the government asked him why silver was exiting so quickly. Newton responded that he believed people love silver for fashion, but either way, this change of 5% from 21 to 20 was not gonna do much when we examined the discrepancy at the time between silver prices in England and Asia. In England, it took 15 pounds of silver to buy one pound of gold, but in China, it took only 10, meaning silver was 50% more valuable in China. China, and Newton's 5% change was not the key difference that historians claim. As we move through the 1700s, silver continued to be melted and shipped abroad, and silver was depleted. Eventually, there was such a small amount of silver that the gold standard had arrived in everything but law. In 1774, legal contracts said that citizens could not use silver if the transaction was larger than 25 pounds. Wars with France started in 1793. The French sought to gain territories. One general at the time, Napoleon, was very successful and began winning large amounts of territory. As war took its toll, England lost gold. England suspended convertibility of the people's banknotes into gold. A cartoon from the time shows Prime Minister William Pitt trying to seduce an older lady for her gold. That is how badly gold had been reduced for the government. As war with France continued, paper money flourished, but surprisingly so did the economy. 1792 to 1815 saw a period of continuous economic growth. In 1804, Napoleon would crown himself Emperor of France, and the wars continued until 1815. The decline of silver continued. In 1816, Britain reduced the silver in a silver coin by 6%, but the coin would still be worth the same amount. However, citizens could convert this silver coin into gold for the correct value. The point of this was to keep silver coins in circulation. By reducing silver in the coin, but having it still buy the same amount of gold coins, it would ensure people didn't melt down these coins as they were less valuable and therefore had more value than silver value. England was able to rebuild its gold reserves. And by 1821, citizens could freely convert their notes into gold. But the long time period of holding banknotes made the people fairly happy to keep them and they didn't exchange these notes so rapidly for gold. During this time, people gained confidence for paper money. 
The gold standard was formalized for the first time in history in 1821. The money in the economy of Great Britain would revolve around gold, meaning prices would rise if more gold was found. But as we move through the 1800s, there would be a new powerhouse, the United States, and soon its actions would determine gold's fate. While Europe was moving towards gold, the pre-US in the 1700s was actually using tobacco for its currency, but this quickly changed. The US introduced paper notes around its origins in 1776, but like many early paper money countries, it had runaway inflation. Therefore, in the 1780s, a constitutional convention forced states to pay their debt only in silver and gold. The US was quickly on a bimetal standard. Soon the US would move towards more of a gold standard. In 1834, then US President Andrew Jackson made the Coinage Act, which undervalued silver, and more silver was then shipped abroad because of the mispricing. Even though the US was technically on a bimetal standard, there were signs of difficulty during the Civil War from 1861 to 65. The US began issuing notes with no convertibility, showing a chink in the commodity-based standard, that in times of duress, having a money supply that could grow was needed. The US Act in 1873 refused to turn silver into legal tender, so people who owned large amounts of silver could no longer turn it into money in the US. Essentially now the US was on the gold standard in all but official name. The international gold standard was peaking at this time. In 1871, many countries began tying their money supply to gold, as Britain did in 1821. First Germany, then Switzerland, Belgium, Italy, France, then the Nordic countries, then the Netherlands, then Spain, Austria, Russia, Japan, India. Finally, the US formalized the gold standard when it officially tied the US money supply to gold through the Gold Standard Act in 1900. The money supply was based on gold, meaning a citizen could convert a $1 banknote for the equivalent value of gold. The gold standard was peaking at the start of the 20th century, but right at its peak, its decline would soon begin. See, by committing to an international standard, it reduced the US's ability to print currency, putting constant inflationary and deflationary pressure on the economy and many countries on the standard after 1871 had to shortly abandon it and then reinstate it when citizens wanted to convert a lot of money. There was tremendous inflation in the early 1900s as more gold was found in Alaska, but then there would be periods of rapid deflation as the economy grew quicker than gold. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913 and gold and it would come at odds. This was because the Fed's goal was to create a stable currency. This was essentially impossible to do when money was tied to gold. The gold standard had already failed in many wars, such as in the French War in the late 1700s, when Britain suspended convertibility. But politicians needed a modern day war and World War I shook everyone's confidence in the standard forever. Many countries had to abandon the standard in World War I as they were not able to pay gold to citizens and they needed to keep their gold to pay for war supplies. A huge issue with the standard is if people wanted their gold, in order to dissuade them, a country would have to raise its interest rates because then that person would get more interest on their money. But higher interest rates would then slow down the economy. This would always be an issue with the gold standard. Instead of choosing economic paralysis, countries in World War I abandoned the standard. In the 1920s, the US tried to restore the gold standard, but it led to a huge contraction in their economy and around the world. But by the mid-1920s, under US threat, France and Britain actually rejoined the standard. But as we moved into the Great Depression, more issues with gold were appearing. A quick issue is seen that all the countries when they're on the gold standard relied on each other following the rules. Milton Friedman, the famous economist of the 20th century, proved that the US started and perpetuated the Great Depression. Gold actually flowed into the US during the depression. It was explained as follows. If the US was hardest hit, then its people were poor and they would buy less goods from Britain. As people did worse, prices would drop in the US. This would make US goods more attractive to British people. British people would then pay for those goods in money, which was backed by gold, meaning gold would enter the US. However, the Federal Reserve was supposed to play by the rules and expand the money supply, but it did not. It vaulted the gold and this currency never entered the US market. So during the depression, US prices dropped by over 30%. If prices drop, it incentivizes one to hold currency as why buy something today if it's cheaper tomorrow? The economy greatly contracted. Seeing all the issues, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt abandoned the gold standard with his 1934 Gold Act. This would reduce gold to a short footnote in history. The US essentially seized everyone's gold. This is what the Romans did in the early ADs. Previously, people were promised they could convert their bills into gold, but now they couldn't. The new world governments were perhaps more formalized, bigger, and stronger. 
But the U.S. government and the world just did the same thing that the Romans did. They promised their citizens convertibility into gold or silver. The citizens stored gold with the government and trusted them. And then the government seized all the gold and said, we will not pay you back in gold. This isn't an argument against the current fiat standard, but it is an issue of how to best run a gold standard. Can governments ever be trusted with your gold? The last remnants of the dying gold standard can be seen in the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was created in 1944 and went into effect in 1946. Once again, we could see that governments could not be trusted with gold. The US had a lot of power after World War II as it controlled more than two thirds of the world's gold. The standard said the US would redeem international US dollars held by foreign countries into gold if needed. For a time, the system worked, but as the economies of Europe and Japan improved, the US invested more US dollars abroad. Most people would assume the standard failed because the US had a negative trade balance. But during this time, the current account or the trade account was actually mostly a trade surplus. It was actually through the capital account where money exited the US and went into foreigners' hands. For example, an American buying a $100 Canadian bond would be a negative $100 capital balance. This Canadian could then redeem $100 for American gold. At home, from Franklin Roosevelt, US citizens could not redeem their dollars into gold, but international citizens could, and they can now demand payment. As we move through the 1950s, this deficit averaged $3.1 billion a year. As international US dollars grew relative to its gold balance, the US had little choice but to end convertibility. Once again, gold was promised for dollars, but it was not redeemed. In 1971, President Nixon closed the gold window, and in 1973, the current system that we have today of free floating currencies was established. The gold standard was dead. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. So let's quickly go over a summary of why gold failed. Gold is not a safe haven, despite what people think. There's basically no place to put your gold. If you store your gold with the government, the government has shown throughout history that it will steal your gold. If you store your gold with private citizens, well, that's also pretty risky and runs essentially a libertarian government. So there's no way to safely store your gold. This is what guys like Peter Schiff don't get. Would he argue a purely libertarian standard where only private citizens keep gold? And what would happen in times of duress? Would governments then do what they always do, of take the gold? This would need to be established in a future gold standard. The third reason is gold is unstable. As can be seen in this chart, there was constant inflation and deflationary pressures when using the gold standard. This is because if the economy grows quicker than gold, then there would be deflation. And if gold is found, such as in Alaska in 1909, there's rapid inflation. More will be discussed about fixed currency issues in a future video, but essentially fixed money supply currencies or currency based on some sort of commodity usually has negative effects for an economy. The worst part of gold is it's terrible in a recessionary environment where countries are bounded to some fixed money supply. So when there is a recession, people want to redeem their gold, but this is the worst time for the government as they need their gold to pay for things. In order to keep the gold, the government starts raising interest rates, which slows down the economy further. Essentially, gold is one of the worst currencies to use when a recession occurs. As we said, we'll discuss the issues of a fixed money supply currencies in a future video. But it can be seen in reason number three, that a fixed money supply can produce rapid inflation and deflation. The last reason is the gold standard is unfair. If there is deflation, it incentivizes miners to find new gold. And when miners find new gold, they essentially share in all that wealth. Essentially wealth is printed by people who mine the gold, which isn't a very fair system of wealth allocation. I hope this helps summarize why the gold standard failed and why the currency should never be used in the future.